All right, we are live. Happy Friday, guys. Welcome back to the Virtual Vaults. Uh, as we segue into the weekend with some cast ring drams, I'm joined by, well, you guys, you introduce yourselves. My friends and colleagues are with me today. And obviously, their names are displayed, your names are displayed, so it's not a secret. Uh, and we've also announced it before. But uh, I'm Ben Dietrich, and I'm joined by... All right. I'm Jenna Eli, out in Los Angeles. And... Zach? <laughs> I'm Zach. I'm out here in Orlando. Wow, guys. We, this is a great start. It's been a long week for us. It's been a long week, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so first of all, guys, th thank you all for joining us. We're pretty excited about this one. I think this is something that we haven't done before. Uh, we've had a lot of fun with these live tastings. And, you know, you guys keep asking for more and more live tastings. And so as we're stuck in this pandemic of, you know, the, the current coronavirus situation, which has kept most of us indoors for for safety measures uh we're just finding new ways to experiment and bring the society you know home to you guys and so uh today what are we doing jenna what are we doing you can you can introduce it so today's kind of fun because we are going to talk about the art of tasting whiskey um and kind of what that entails from kind of start to finish and i think there's some things that you know are pretty standard across the board that a lot of people you know do in their daily Kind of practice when it comes to daily, weekly, whatever the case is, practice of tasting whiskey. Um, but there's also a lot of things in there that I believe are subjective. And we're just going to kind of like, you know, give our opinions and thoughts on kind of the process of tasting whiskey. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to, I mean, maybe you guys probably can relate and or everybody tuning in too. When I first got into whiskey, uh, I was a little intimidated with, with the process uh, simply because I heard so many different opinions from so many different people telling me how to do it. And, I, you know, the, what what I was trying out wasn't necessarily ma matching with the experience I was having and versus what I was being told. Um, so I think, you know, today we're, we're, we're going to share our personal experience, some tips and sort of explain why they are useful. Because I think that's that's really the key that's missing in a lot of uh, whiskey instruction. You know, it's people tell you how to do things. And you sort of just accept it, you know, this is this way be because, but they don't really explain why. Right. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll go into to why things are important, you know, and, and with, with everything, you know, let's just make the distinction. What we'll be talking about today is, is really how to get the most out of your tasting experience. You know, the art of tasting whiskey, uh, which is very different. I don't know for me, if you guys agree, let, let me know. But uh, it's very different from just sitting down and having a dram and just having a casual have right. a drink. You know, I, I think there's, there's no wrong way to drink a whiskey. What do you think, sir? No, yeah. I mean, I'm on board with that. Uh, you know, before I, I started drinking as much as I do now and enjoying as much as I do now, it was more or less I grab a glass of whiskey at the bar, you, you drink it, you know, and it's it's more of a sip thing while you talk to others. Um, whereas now I find myself, you know, immersing into what I'm drinking and figuring out what it is and where it's from. And it, it's a completely different experience. Um, but I think it's with anything you do, you know, when you understand it a bit more and you're a little bit more practiced in it, it, it makes it a lot more enjoyable. So it's, it's definitely something I'm, I'm very excited to share with. So, yeah. So I want to just, and I, before we get started too, I want to jump over to the chat. We currently, there are 155 of you guys watching. Really appreciate that. This is officially the biggest Stock <laughs> Whiskey Society of America online <laughs> virtual gathering. So uh, I was just catching up to some comments and apologize. We'll, we'll, throughout this whole session, you know, we want to hear from you guys too. And we'll be highlighting various comments, but. Uh, just Joseph Horton start off. Hi, everyone. New member. Can't wait to see what's in store. Welcome, Joseph. Oh, there's a lot here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say that again. I'm, Joseph, I'm... he's um, in Hawaii. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Beautiful Hawaii. So oh, wow. um, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Welcome from Hawaii. Yeah. We, we, have, we have a growing group of members out in Hawaii, which is amazing. Yeah. I, I really am finding it looking for an excuse to get out there. Uh, not anytime soon, I'm afraid. But, um <laughs> Brandon Schmaltz says, what's being tasted? We'll, we'll get to that short, shortly, Brandon. Uh, Pam Longville says, hello from Minnesota. Pam, good to see you. Karen is back. K Karen left, left uh, excuse me, Lefkowitz. Hi from DC. Looking forward to this. Glad to have you back, Karen. Uh, Justin Izzo, hi from Little Rock Island, everyone. Hope people are safe and well. Uh, fortunately, I think the three of us are safe and well and yeah. about to have a few drams, which is good. So, um, you know, I apologize. We'll keep going. We want to get this on the road. There are a lot of you guys in here now. I just saw that George Kaplan says, hello, all waiting on FedEx to deliver some SMWS. Just poured some 68.29. That's like the, the best and worst feeling is when whiskey's in transit. <laughs> you know I mean? like it's, it's, it's on the delivery, but you don't know when. 
Yeah. Just checking uh, the tracking like every 30 minutes. <laughs> I know. So I, I, when I, when I, when I whiskey, yeah, SMWS whiskey and route, I sign up for all the notifications or the alerts, like the status updates, but yet I still refresh the page, you know, on the tracking. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's, it's a problem to have. And sorry, if you're wondering, I'm cleansing my plot with some coffee here, but anyway. So what is Zach? What are you drinking tonight? Um, I mean, I, I pulled out a few things that I wanted to revisit. I haven't, you know, had in a while. Um, I think I'll start with some 58.32, though. I have Fruit Loop. Um, I found this really enjoyable when we first tasted it. I think we tasted it at uh, the gathering event we did in September down in Miami. Oh, um, yeah, that was fun. So, yeah, so I'm going to revisit this, see if it brings back some memories. There you go. How about you guys? I am drinking some 29.247 because it is like 100 degrees here in LA today. And naturally, I would just gravitate towards the peatiest thing I can find. Um, so this is a 19-year Isla in uh, ex-bourbon. But I tasted this for the first time just a wee bit a very long time ago. Um, and I haven't had it since then. So I thought this would be a nice time to really, you know, get reacquainted with this. This is a perfect opportunity to do that. So that's what I'm having. What about you, Ben? Um, so I'm going with, this was a, a personal highlight. This is 135.1 called Sensual Sensory Sensation. Uh, so previous 16 year old Highland whiskey previously in an ex bourbon hogshead and then transferred to, it says here first fill ex sauterne. So lovely French dessert wine, uh, mm -hmm. sauterne, which I think is fantastic. Not as common with whis whiskey maturation, but if you can find it, I, I go all into it. So a little bit of sauterne to, to carry me into the weekend. Not so, bad. um, anyway, so yeah, so. Everybody, everybody, we'll we'll do our best. It's it's a it's a it's a big group tonight, and we appreciate you all being here. Uh, we want to kind of stay on the uh, the topic of you know just sharing our tips with tasting whiskey and how to, to do that. Uh, Jenna, you want to start us off? I, I think maybe we should just break down quickly the way we want to present it. First, I think there's when it comes to tasting whiskey, understanding really sort of setting the the environment and getting ready. I think Jenna, you want to, you want to, Jenna wanted to touch upon all of the things that I think that most of us, when we get into whiskey, don't really consider things that impact, you know, how spirit can actually smell and taste to you based on all these different factors. Then we'll sort of get into the actual approach and appearance and presentation and I'll, you know, kind of move our way towards the tasting. We'll get into how to taste different tips, things backed back by science. And then obviously along the way, as we're sharing our tips together, we want to hear from you guys. So, uh, Whatever you know, you think there's no one way to do things at times. So keep commenting, and and we'll try to follow along. Yeah. So all right. So let's kick this off. So I personally wanted to talk about um, you know environment and kind of the prep that goes into tasting whiskey. So a lot of times, at least for me, you know, I when I want to just have like a casual dram at home, um, you know, after a long day, I don't really think about a lot of you know, these little factors that go into this very multi-sensory experience, you know, when it comes to tasting whiskey, but when it's a whiskey that when I've not tasted before, um, and a whiskey that I'm really trying to, to understand and get really good tasting notes and, and, you know, to really just learn the most I can about a certain whiskey, you know, the, the preparations that I take, I, I feel are important and they do definitely have, you know, an influence on the way the whiskey tastes. And so, you know, flavor, you know, perception again is very, very multi-sensory. And so for me, um, some of the, the first things that I do is um, I make sure that I have everything here. So I have my, my glassware, I have my whiskey, obviously, <laughs> most important part. Um, I do have water if I decide that I'm gonna add water to that. Um, I have my notebook, I have my pen, and I'm either here at my desk or I'm at my dining room table, which is like my favorite place to really dissect a whiskey just because I can have everything in front of me. And I don't have to worry about any kind of outside factor, um, you know, interrupting me. And so usually I have the dog snoring at my feet, which actually she's snoring at my feet now. So if you hear snoring, it's not me. Um, <laughs> your dog is snoring at your feet. <laughs> she's, she's here snoring. So, um, but I just really try to make sure I have everything I need. So I'm not, you know, getting up and going to grab water or I can really just focus my attention on the whiskey. Um, and so some of the other things that I think about as far as environment goes are things like, do I have a candle lit? Because if I have a candle lit, 
the aroma and smell from that candle are going to affect the way that the nose on this whiskey is is coming through. Um, did Jarrell just make dinner and the smell of, you know, spaghetti and meatballs is still filling the air. Um, these are all things that, you know, I kind of think about, or if I have any kind of like air freshener plug-in in the wall, there's so many things that can just already affect your smell. You've got a stinky dog at your feet. I mean, there's so many things that can, you know, throw off your sense of smell. So when I'm really, again, nosing, tasting whiskey for the first time, these are all things that I kind of check off um, to make sure that, you know, aren't coming back and giving me adverse reactions when I'm, you know, smelling the whiskey. Um, some of the other things that um, I think about are like environment as far as do I have a movie distracting me in the background or, you know, I, I wait for like the kids to go to bed and I have like, you know, time to sit and really focus and have a quiet moment. Um, and for me personally, I love to put on a little Sidney Bechet. <laughs> Um, he's, I listen to him all day long and he really just kind of relaxes my mind. And I find that music really, you know, helps me kind of get in the mood to taste whiskey. And so I, it's funny because there have actually been a lot of studies done on this. Um, there was a professor um, over at Oxford University who actually did a study on this. Um, and they said that lighting and music can act as a digital seasoning for food and wine. And I think you can take that even though it's food and wine and you can bring that into whiskey. I think those same rules really do apply. And so um, I try to just kind of create a scene for myself and make sure I have the lights down, I have the music on, everything's quiet and I can just sit and really focus on the whiskey. So do you guys do that at home or? Ben? Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, no, at first I didn't, you know, at first I, I didn't believe, I didn't believe it at first. I was like, okay, it's whiskey. It's above 50% ABV. It's strong. I can smell right. it. I can taste it. Nothing's going to impact. Yeah. That was kind of my belief uh, to be honest. And I was a little naive at the time, but as I realized it and I sort of found myself in a situation either for our team, you know, really having to get into a whiskey and discern it. I, I found it really distracting if there was really bright lights or yeah. music playing and, and it's a really good point about the sort of, I like that digital dressing. I'd never heard that before. That's, yeah, I, like, I like that because a lot of people talk about pairing music with whiskey. And I'm like, oh, how does that really work? But it makes sense because if it's the wrong mood, I just, I can't, I can't, I struggle to smell and taste effectively, you know, or I miss out something. So uh, yeah, I, I'm definitely, it's one of the, you guys, if you probably, if you think like I did, what well, does it really yeah. matter? Just try it. You know, I think you, you'll be surprised. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm all for it. I think that I've gotten to a point where I've been doing this, you know, for the right amount of, you know, the, for so long, I guess, that I've kind of dialed it in. So I really know, like, what kind of music, like, relaxes my brain, that I can really focus on this, and I don't have to, like, get distracted about anything else. I can really, again, just focus on what it is that I'm, I'm nosing and I'm tasting. Um, and so the other thing, too, is, you know, just... I don't ever taste whiskey if I'm, t again, tasting it for the first time, like really, you know, getting into it. I wait at least an hour after I've eaten. Mm. Uh, and so I don't do like tastings right after dinner or the hour is like the minimum I'll wait to really get in. That way I can kind of have time to kind of cleanse my palate and, um, you know, kind of prep it for, you know, getting into tasting whiskey. What would you suggest for, you know, if this is, I'm trying to think of a scenario. I mean, I've run into this, but you know, when you don't have an hour or say like you're going to a tasting, you know, like, right. tasting that we would host in person, let's say you're going to taste a whiskey and you needed to get some food down. What, what would you suggest for, for like a quick cleanse, you know? Um, so for, for me, and I do this in between whiskeys, if I'm tasting multiple whiskeys as well, um, I don't do cold water and I don't do hot water. I do just room temperature water just to keep my palate at that good solid, you know, consistent temperature because your whiskey's not going to be chill and it's not going to be hot. It's going to be at room temperature as well. Yeah. And so you don't want to kind of give your palate this, you know, bouncing all over the place, you know, in temperature, because that will throw off the way that you taste. And so um, I would just, you know, cleanse with a good room temperature water. Cause I don't, I don't know if I would want to put any, they say like in sushi, you eat, you're supposed to like eat ginger is supposed to be your palate cleanser. But I feel like if I put anything very, powerful and overpowering flavor wise, um, that it will have an effect on what it is I'm tasting. 
So, but um, one of the cool things, another thing you could do, I don't know if you carry these in your bag if you're at a tasting or you have them with you, but um, when I judged for whiskeys of the world and we had, you know, 60 plus whiskeys to taste through in a day, um, I was like, oh, I'm going to get palate fatigue and nose fatigue. And I was worried about that. And so I'm there for the first time and all these people around me who are like experts who have done this before. And I see people smelling their arm like this, just like this. And I'm like, what are they doing? This is insane. Like, is this like part of it? Do I need to like smell my arm? But what that does is it resets your nose. So if you need to like do a good reset on your nose, you can smell your arm. Just make sure you don't have any like lotion or anything scented like perfume on, or you can always rely on coffee beans. So coffee beans have been used in the wine industry and kind of resetting your, your nose um, for quite some time. So keep some coffee beans in your bag, I guess, <laughs> to with you. Um, or another thing you could do too for palate is to eat some water, like a water cracker or like an unsalted saltine. So just like a very plain cracker to kind of reset your palate. So those are some little tips and tricks you can, you know, keep in your back pocket for. Any start kind of sniffing my arm everywhere I go. I know. <laughs> the arm sniffing is interesting, but it, you think about it, it, makes sense. I mean, you're sort of grounding yourself, you know, yes, and like exactly you don't what know what we know, like, but people have carry an, an aroma. Yeah. Odor, but I feel like aroma is a better, more pleasant whiskey. <laughs> term. But we all carry our own aroma, and uh, it makes total sense to ground yourself. And all right, I'm going to do that the rest of the day. Uh, just to, while we're going through this too, you guys, I just want to catch up in the comments. You know, a lot over 200 kind of in the chat, and so I appreciate y'all being here. I'm curious to know, do you have other tips yourselves about you know how to prepare yourself for a whiskey tasting? Sort of set the mood. You know, eliminate odors is one. And Jenna just talked about. Obviously, we talked about sort of eliminating uh, other sensory distractions, music, or or at least finding the right music. To, you know, to to get you in the mood. Uh, Let's Drink Whiskey says, I find the best foods are slightly salty and too fatty. Um, also talking to George, there's a little co side conversation there going on, but uh, Ryan M says, where are my sherry heads at? Tapping into some Dusky and Deep. Sounds good. Uh, oh, good. I want to just kind of just kind of go through the chat real quick and, and say on top of things. Uh, Jess L says, I'm joined virtually by my brother-in-law from Norfolk. Happy to meet you all. Welcome, Jess. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for being here. And I saw some, yeah, I'll go through them, but as we're doing, I saw some, I was la trying not to laugh, but I <laughs> some of these comments, but. I'm over here laughing on the side. I know. So, I know. Know. Someone said they smell their dog's feet or something. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I did not see that one. That's interesting. Well, it's That's funny because funny. you mentioned like setting the mood and you said you have a sleeping dog right by you, which is funny because I also do, but in quarantine, like that's the reality, you know. <laughs> do you do you guys find that, so I mean, going back to what we're talking about, but with setting the mood and the really the importance of it because obviously we i think we've agreed that it, it does impact what you smell and taste what do you think about in general just enjoying a dram at a bar i mean by definition like what we're talking about that seems like there's a lot of distractions you know there's it's loud do you prefer do you do you like that do you prefer to just do your whiskey at home i mean honestly for me i, I kind of have two like normally i don't drink out um you know it's gotten to a point where I, I know what i what i enjoy and where i enjoy it and i feel most comfortable doing it at home um but like you just mentioned the, the environment isn't for me you know having all that noise and side chat and people talking like i'd, I'd, I'd much rather sit and talk about the whiskey with someone else and, and you know learn their stories and listen to what they have to say um, cause I know I can go home and drink, you know, I, I come home and I can talk to myself all night, but I've heard the stories many a times. Um, so I actually personally don't usually drink whiskey when I'm out. I'll normally stick with water or maybe a beer. Uh, that's, that's, that's me. Wow. That was the, uh, the shocker of the day. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't drink whiskey when he's out. Okay. Yeah. What about you? Uh, Jeff? made a good comment that she grabs a whiskey buddy, that it's a great way to explore the flavor notes and see what different taste buds pick up. And I agree with this completely. Um, yeah. I, Drell's always, my, my husband's always my sounding board um, because we have very different palettes. And so we usually get, you know, very different things. And it's always fun to just kind of bounce notes off of each other, um, you know, to see the experience of other people, you know, because it's so subjective and it's something different, you know, on a very intimate way for every person. So. I'm I'm fully on board with grabbing a buddy if you can. Yeah, I think it's it's a great point. I mean, what we're talking about today is 
how to really get the most out of your own sort of personal tasting experience. It's it's sort of a you in the glass or you in the in the whiskey type of thing. But you're right. I mean, ultimately, <laughs> my best my best whiskey moments are had with other people. So and that's often you know I think people can come over here. I can go over to their home, but that happens a lot of bars. So uh, yeah, I don't want to get off topic on that, but I, I totally agree with, with yeah. you on and and the, was it Jess who mentioned that yeah. having, a, having a whiskey buddy? I, yeah, I fully agree on that one. Um, I'll point out Brian too. He said I've had many a good dram at a bar, but only with like minded aficionados. Uh, and I'll just point out, I remember my my first time meeting meeting you, Ben, in Chicago. Um, we were going out for the tasting, and there are some, you know, there's some great times and you know, little dive bars. You drink a glass of whiskey, but it's it's the company that really makes it. You know, it's you're able to talk about it. You can bounce ideas off of each other, tasting notes. Um, but it's usually the memories to me. You know, this is a, a side note, but a lot of times the whiskeys I remember the most are the memories that are had with them, and and you know they taste the best. So yeah, completely off topic, obviously, but. I, I, it's a personal opinion. I, I really truly believe in that. So it's a good point it, it, that Brian brought up. Brandon Schmaltz says, one of my favorite things to do under normal circumstances is to host private tastings with tapas and several whiskeys. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's great. There's nothing better than that. I think yeah. um, Paul, good to see you, Paul. Paul Mary says Delilah's has been a great tasting venue in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I agree. Miss mm -hmm. Miss went to Delilah's in Chicago. Zach, you came there with me as well. Jenna, did you go to Delilah's in Chicago? I think we went to Delilah's. I don't think I don't think last time you were here, but we'll have to yeah. we'll have to go there next time. Um, and Jared Whiskey says bars are for cocktails, home is for whiskey. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a uh, can go either way, but I I think to your point, Jenna, earlier about just minimizing sort of distractions and sensory right. overload. When it comes to tasting, it's easier to pick out all the aromas and flavors when it's sort of just you have the right setting environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just you and the whiskey, and it's um. Yeah, so when I when I do tastings, you know, at bars or I'm going to tasting events, it's just a very different experience. Um, so for me personally, I prefer to be home um, so I can just really focus on what it is I'm tasting and really get my environment right. You know, I know that this environment is what will produce the best results for me. And so um, I prefer to do that. So, but after I kind of get, you know, the environment, the mood right, um, the mood is set. I make sure that I'm using also, um, you know, particular glassware when I'm tasting whiskey for a first time. Um, so for me, you know, when I'm casual at home, just, you know, having a regular dram, I typically like to go for, um, you know, something like a Canadian Glencairn. This is probably, you know, when I use most often, I just like the weight and it does still have that like kind of tulip shape. But again, when I'm tasting for the first time and I'm really trying to get good notes, um, I'm always going for uh, like a, a copia or, you know, a traditional Glencairn glass. Um, so these are the two that I kind of bounce back and forth with um, when I'm tasting, you know, again for the first time. And this particular glass, the copita is, you know, the traditional Spanish sherry style glass that, you know, the most distillers, blenders, um, it's kind of the glass of choice, I believe, um, that people use. And it's because it kind of has, I don't know if you can you can kind of see it, but um, it has kind of that broad bowl middle and then it just tapers up towards the top. So all of those aromas kind of brew in the belly of the glass and then that way they can be funneled up towards your nose. Yeah. So this is typically, you know, the glass I use the most for when I'm tasting for the first time. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I, I think, you know, the glasses have many uses. So for me, depending on the mood and what I want and you know, whether there's been a long day and I, I don't want to sit down and think too much about what I'm drinking. I just want to enjoy it because I'm comfortable with it. I know the flavors. I know what to expect. You know, I'll reach for a rocks glass or a Canadian Glencairn because it's easy. Um, yeah. But otherwise, for the first time, I'm, I'm the same. You know, my my little Copina glass is something that if if I want to taste a whiskey for the first time, I will not personally do not taste it in, a, in like a rocks glass because I know the experience won't be the same. Um, so I try to use the same glass every time when I taste a whiskey for the first time. Um, so I'm with you on that. And and Tom mentioned too, you know, try tasting the same whiskey in each of these glasses. And if I do get a difference and I can already, like the, the difference is significant. Um, I do that, you know, from time to time where um, I will, you know, take a rocks glass or, you know, even the neat glass um, and the, the nose is, is, significantly different um again my, my husband prefers a rock glass all the time he won't touch anything else and when we have the same whiskey 
um, we often compare classes and they are just, you know, huge differences um, in, in the way that the aroma is delivered to your nose. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, when we talk about and then that's a great point. Uh, same whiskey, different classes. Is there a difference? And I think a lot of us just assume that oh, that's kind of crazy, right? Because it's we've never we've never sort of been exposed to that sort of reality. Right. With wine, we have all different types of stemware oh, for yeah. wine. You know, you have Bordeaux glasses. You know, white wine glasses are a little bit smaller than big red wine glasses. We've sort of accepted that, you know, socially. But with right. whiskey, we have this like this preconceived notion that's kind of crazy that, that that glass doesn't matter. I've always thought that was kind of funny, but yeah. I, I've definitely noticed that. Yeah, generally, I, I put I've done the whole glass experiment at home where I poured, and I would encourage you guys to do this if if, if well if you're bored in quarantine. Which I think like most of us, <laughs> now's a good now's a good time to do something like this. But <laughs> but pour the same whiskey in different glasses and see how it is. I mean, for me. At the end of the day, you know, if I'm not going to be do, picking the right glass and figuring out which glass is best for smoky whiskey, which is better for sort of more sweeter or fruitier whiskeys, I think just a kind of classic bulb shaped glass, like our society tasting glasses, which I actually don't have it in front of me because they're all at, at my office, which is locked down. Yeah, Zach, Zach has one. I think you guys have seen these. These are, are sort of our classic society tasting glasses. But something with a bulb shape that can actually funnel the aromas um, is, I, and I, I like a stem because it sort of, I don't know. On one hand, it, it keeps the temperature. I mean, your hand creates heat and it doesn't impact the actual uh, spirit. But it, I don't know. Jenna, you were telling me, what was the other thing you were telling me? You were yeah, giving, so a about why stem is important. There's a few reasons. So one of the reasons is it keeps your stinky hands away from your nose. So, you know, if you're holding a glass, let's say, you know, in the case of your hand, again, like you said, one, you're heating the whiskey, which, you know, sometimes that's something that you want to do to, you know, maybe pull out different aromas. You want to keep the, the whiskey you know, in the glass in your hand. But, you know, if you have any kind of, you know, smells on your oh, hand, then. I think that would kind of pollute the, the aroma of the whiskey. The stem keeps your hand away from, you know. I want to point out a question. Um, Jess L. just asked, is this the Tom Smith from the box <laughs> events? So Tom Smith in chat is actually our senior director here at the Scotsmont Whiskey Society. So I see him answering some questions for you guys. So he has been in chat. He's been answering some questions for you. Um, so feel free to, to listen to him. Kind of knows what he's talking about, but we, we all accept him anyways. Tom is also quarantined in a cabin upstate New York with what I assume is an abundance of whiskey, uh, possibly some wine and nothing but the freshest air up there. Uh, a bit envious, but yeah, I can't. I shouldn't complain. I, I'm pretty good. He can scream at the top of his lungs, and nobody will ever hear. <laughs> so let's um, let, let's move on. If you guys if you guys don't mind too, I think obviously there's a lot to cover. And so we've talked about obviously setting the mood, setting the environment, some of the factors, glassware, of course, you know. And I think the conclusion is at least what I suggested is uh, go try it. Go try different whiskeys and different glasses. Find one that's right for you. You know, I think consider sort of fluid dynamics and aromas and how they transfer, you know, with a, a proper shape. But uh, I mean, I guess next comes down to sort of the presentation. Zach, do you want to kind of touch on that? I think we were talking earlier, you had some good tips about, I guess, what, what's there? Okay, we've set the mood, we're in the room, we're ready, yeah. <laughs> ready for the drama already. We've spent 30 minutes preparing for it. What, what's next? So, so you know, Personally, I come from a small wine background. So one of the things when you first pour a wine is a lot of times when you're doing a proper tasting is you look at the wine. You want to see what it looks like. You know, the color, you can tell by a grape varietal, by how dark the wine is, how light it is, uh, the hue of purple and whatnot. Um, when it comes to whiskey, though, um, it gets a little bit more difficult um, at times. Uh, here at the Society, when we bottle our whiskey, we do not add any color. It's all natural colored. Uh, so for us, when we look at the whiskey, you can usually tell, you know, sometimes cask types. Um, you have a dark red, amber hue. Um, you're probably looking at maybe like a sherry cask or a port cask. Um, you're looking at, you know, like a naked yellow here. Um, you could be, you know, the darker the yellow is probably like a first fill bourbon. Um, whereas the lighter ones, it might be a refill or whatnot. Um, but, you know, when a lot of people buy bottles on the shelves, there's a lot of times color, caramel coloring added to these whiskeys, which does nothing to the taste. Um, but they want consistency in their whiskeys and they want the whiskey to be attractive to the eye of the consumer. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you might pour a whiskey that's 12 years old at 43%. Um, that's maybe as dark as a first fill sherry cask that's been there for 15 years. Um, and it gets a little bit tricky when you get to that kind of stuff. Um, but thankfully here, 
like I said, it's all natural coloring. So when you look at it, you can have a pretty good idea of what you're getting yourself into. Um, at the same time, same as wine, when you look at the whiskey, um, the alcohol levels, um, when you take a look at it, people like to refer to them as legs. So with legs, um, it's not really a term that refers to any tastes or anything like that. Um, the legs in terms of alcohol, when you swirl your glass and they're, and they're dripping down it. Um, Can you show me your legs, Zach? Just for yeah. that. So you can kind of see them there at the top. Oh, I, I, would, okay. I would show you my legs, but I'm not really that. that no, but I'm curious to see your, 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 your whiskey legs. I want to see. So are the, the, the tears. Let's see if you can kind of see them up there. They're running a little slower. Um, so this guy I have here actually is cask 54.76, Habuna Matata. Um, so this guy comes in in a first fill ex bourbon barrel. So like I said, the darker the color makes a little bit of sense. Um, and it comes in at 59.4%. So when you're looking at those legs, the slower those roll down the glass, the thicker the alcohol content. The content. So it's essentially making it run a little bit slower. Uh, the less the alcohol, how, to, how to get the legs. I'm just just because I'm curious. I've heard different methods too. Like how, what yeah. are? Do you mind pointing them out? Because I'm. Yeah. So curious. so what I, I do is I, I usually throw my whiskey, um, and you'll see them kind of build up around the top of the glass or wherever it ended, um, and you'll kind of see them roll down like tears. Um, Essentially, what it's telling you is the alcohol, again, the alcohol content, when you have more water, so when you when you proof down a whiskey, you're adding water to it, the quicker those those tears are going to run, you know, obviously water is thinner than, than alcohol. So what it does is it just essentially gives you a kind of a basic idea of how much alcohol um, is in the glass, but it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, what's it going to taste like or anything like that. Um, so those are just kind of some visual things I look at when I first taste the whiskeys. Um, so but, if you're drinking blind and someone hands you a dram, like a friend at a bar or somewhere, yeah. you can. So you essentially that's that's an interesting trip because it's a good way to tell. You can yeah. at least estimate if it's a high ABV, if it's a high yeah. alcohol content, based just, on what the speed at which. So I'm just trying to like coat the glass here and just yeah. see, you can kind of see them. Well, I don't know if you can see on camera, but maybe yeah, I don't know if you can see them on camera. But these are kind of I mean, moving at pretty slow speed. Yeah. Uh, so for me, the way I think, you know, when I take a look at it, I'm going to know what am I about to put on my tongue? Because I'm, I'm going to swirl it around. And personally, with with the amount of alcohol that comes across my palate, you know, if I get something that's 40 percent alcohol, if I leave it on my tongue too long, it mixes too much with the saliva and, and you lose a lot of those flavor um, molecules. So for me, if, if I know it's going to be a lower proof by, you know, when I first get handed that, um, I know not to let it sit for too long. I, I, I tend to drink it a little bit quicker just to, to get a little bit more flavor out of it. So that's just personally, but. Yeah, my the ABV on mine is also 59.4% and it's it's got great legs. <laughs> yeah, keep in mind, uh, for the most part, all, all these whiskeys from the Scotch and Whiskey Society are single cask, cask strength. So they've been bottled straight from the cask. If you go to your average whiskey shop, most of the whiskey has been sort of watered down prior to bottling. So I think naturally these are the legs as we, you know, as they're called, as Zach introduced, are, are going to be slower. Um, and it, so there's just like this thick band of oil on top, which is all the, you know, because the whiskey's sort of just in its purest form, hasn't really been yeah. chill filtered or anything. It's just the natural sort of thickness that you can actually tell. And these right here dripping out very slow, very oily. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a very, it's a different, it's a different style of whiskey, you know, this sort of yeah. single cast cast strength. There's, there's more essentially what chemically speaking, they are longer chains of, of amino acids that sit in, and fatty acids that sit in the whiskey. Um, so there, it's a little more viscous, it's thicker. That's why, you know, when people talk about drinking cask strength and, and non-chill filtered, um, you're getting a lot more of a rounder mouthfeel. There's, there's a lot more to it. Um, and that's kind of what piles up on the top of the glass. So we can actually talk about that a little bit later when we talk about adding water um, to whiskey is that is that's what is affected in it. Um, but, you know, I think there's a few steps before adding water to a whiskey that I like to go through, at least um, usually starting with the nose. Um, and for me, um, I again, I started in wine. So flavors are very different. You know, there's very specific flavors to look for in, in grape varietals. When it comes to whiskey, there's so many different things from, you know, cask finishes to peat to, to whatever it may be. You know, you have local barleys or, or whatever it is. Um, I like to smell 
so when it comes to my whiskeys, um, I, I smell them a lot before I drink them. So personally, um, uh, something I've picked up on over, over the years, I guess I'd say is I smell everything. Um, and something that has opened my eyes to that is smelling things that are not just whiskey, but in my house, you know, I walk into the kitchen and I try and smell something. What is that? I try and figure it out. Um, so then when I go back to a whiskey, you know, higher alcohol, it's going to be harder to discern specific flavors. Um, so something that I've you know done more and more is, is practice. Um, when you smell a whiskey, the whiskey obviously it hits receptors on the top of your nose, and that runs directly into your brain, um, and it works just like you know studying or or a habit of some sorts. Um, so the more and more you smell that, the more it's retained and moves from your short term memory to your long term memory. Um, so when it comes to whiskey, whiskey has flavors that are tied to memories, tied to you know smells, spices, fruits, dark muddled, whatever it may be, the more you smell those, the more aware you are of them when it comes to smelling them in specific states. Um, so like going to the kitchen, I pull out, I open the spice drawer. I like to pick out a spice and just pick it up and smell it and see what it is. So if I ever notice that specific flavor, I know what it is. Um, and it's just practiced. So, you know, it's literally gotten to the point where I personally now walk around and if I get a, a glass of soda or a glass of wine, a food item. I'm literally the first thing I do is I pick it up and I stick my nose in it before I eat it. And everybody looks at me weird, like, "What are you doing?" And I'm, well, I, I like to smell things. <laughs> it's, but at the end of the day, it's essentially me growing that that library in my brain of smells and flavors and, and aromas, as Ben said. Um, so it's it's something that I like to do when I sit down and I'm in the right environment. You know, when you, when you stick your nose in a glass, I know some people. You know, they like to wafted and whatnot others you know and schnoz right in the glass it, it, you know you're picking up on aromas that you wouldn't normally think about when you're in that environment they're all they're exploding they're they're more popping out because it's what you're focused on um so that that's kind of me what about you guys you guys do anything specific or have any funny habits that that you like to expose Jenna, Jenna, the smell in your arm, the smell in your arm neutralizer was a huge yeah. tip. I mean, I, I can't get that off my mind right now. Truly, really, that uh, Jenna, do you have any more tricks up your sleeve? Like, yeah, the, the only other thing that I do, and I don't know if there's like a scientific, you know, claim to back this, is that I blow a little air in my glass, um, just because. I, I don't know. It just, I feel like it it gets, I get like a, just a burst of those aromas that kind of come back up in the glass. So I'll be like at an event, tasting event or whatever. And I'm like the only person blowing air in my glass. Again, I don't know if there's like a scientific, you know, way about it, but again, you know, this is just one other way that I've really taught huh. myself to nose whiskey. Hmm. I wonder if you're like invigorating the spirit or if it, you know if it's disrupting like sort of the rise of alcohol vapors. I don't know. There's gotta be an explanation. I'm, yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm not sure. I don't know if you guys know, but, you know, when it comes to eating and <laughs> right. and, and drinking, um, most of the flavors that you taste um, that you're you're uh, registering are actually coming from your nose. Um, the nose is probably one of the strongest senses in your body. So I believe and I'm it could be a little bit off, but putting a number to it, about 80 percent of the flavors that you taste are actually coming from your nose. Um, so when you're smelling those, you know, your, your nasal cavity also reaches back into your throat. Um, so when you're smelling, I, I actually, when I smell, I, I like to keep my mouth a little bit open, but I'm wondering if when you blow into the glass, if you've possibly had a sip of it, you're blowing those aromas back into, and the, the hot air coming out is sticking to the sides of the glass and it's closer to your nose. It's not scientific, but I'm wondering. Steve A says, Jenna, that absolutely works. Get a little bit of the built up aromas, et cetera, out without being full strength. So. Oh, yeah. So Steve, Steve had that experience. That, that's actually the first time I've heard anything about yeah. that. You know, um, it's pr pretty interesting. So, uh, but, you know, there's a lot to unpack. I mean, Zach, like your point about the nose being the strong sensory organ in the body. I, I, mean, I remember, and for, for, for you guys watching, you know, joining us today, if you're just getting into whiskey or maybe if, if you're sort of just getting serious about it and if you're tuning in and really wanting to learn and some of these are concepts are very new to you. I think for me, nosing was a, a tough one to sort of figure out because it all smelled the same. Like it all smelled like whiskey. And I was like, what am I really smelling for? And then I kind of realized over a period of yeah, a couple of months, 
with well, I guess time doesn't matter. It's the mileage with after tasting quite a, or nosing quite a few more whiskeys and building sort of a mental library of what is what. I do find that I'm so much more effective at discerning different whiskeys with my nose than I am with my palate. Or, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I do I do both obviously one after the other, but I do find that my nose is more effective at determining. You know, like what what is a really a quality whiskey versus a low, you know, high quality versus low quality. What sort of cask is this? I'm just so much more in tune with my nose than I am with my palate. It's wild, mm -hmm. but it took me a while to get there. So, one other kind of useful tip when I first started getting into whiskey and I didn't know what it is I was smelling. Um, I actually relied on the flavor wheel a little bit, um, just because mm -hmm. there are so many you know flavors on the wheel that you know, I couldn't think of off the top of my head. So it's just something that I always had with me. So if I was smelling something and I was like, oh, this smells like, you know, sweet and fruity, but what is that? And then, you know, the flavor we all would list off, you know, all these different fruits. And then I would be like, oh, well, that's it. You know, like I just needed a kind of a point of reference to put the two together. So that was always kind of a useful tip for me when I first started getting into whiskey, just to, to register, you know, all of these things in my brain when it came to nosing and, and tasting too. So yeah. just thought... Yeah. Let's drink whiskey says I tend to take a sip and let my saliva mix in and swallow about half of it, then breathe in and out through my nose as I continue to taste and swallow the rest. It's been the best for me. I mean, that's, I guess that brings up a good point too. You know, that's hearing that for the first time, like, wow, I gotta, that's, that's a lot of things going on, but maybe, you know, let's, let's drink whiskey. If you can follow up with that. I'm curious to you know for me, a lot of these things when I'm saying them, I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of steps, but it's kind of become subconscious. You know, a lot of these things that we're explaining, I don't really do consciously. It's it's sort of in the back of my brain, um, but it's it's interesting to taste. And then we'll talk about tasting in, in a moment. But tasting and then going back to nosing and like having the whole thing come full circle, yeah. it's, it's pretty wild. Um, Sasha says, "Hi everyone, crazy question. I smell my scotch eighty percent and drink at twenty percent. Anyone else care to share a ratio? These scotches totally skewed me to really nose my scotch much more." Uh, Zach, you kind of you hinted at a similar. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about a ratio, but I mean, like you just said, subconsciously, I'm when I'm I always have to do something with my hands. But when I'm drinking whiskey, it's constantly, you know, I'm I'm just smelling a whiskey, and I might even be thinking about it. But yeah, I'm I'm constantly swirling and smelling just to continue to get flavors. And you know, as the whiskey opens up, different things come to the top. Um, so I think it, you know, it, it's something that I would if I could put a number on it, probably 75, 25 to smelling to taste just because it's, you know, smelling, it doesn't remove it from the glass and it continues to build flavors up for me to help pick out small things. So, I mean, I never thought about it that way, but yeah, probably what it would be. Yeah. Leslie asks, where are the vaults located? Quick little detour on, the, on that. The vaults is, you know, our spiritual home, the Scotch Mall Whiskey Society located in the Port of Leith which is about two miles from the heart of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, you see the picture, oh, sorry, the picture on all of our bottles right here. That is the vaults. It's several hundreds of years old, um, an old bonded you know, sort of facility that's now our members club and our office, our UK office space as well. And I actually it's... believe it is the oldest standing um, alcohol building in, in, Scot in Edinburgh or in, in Leith. Um, I believe before us, it was actually a wine merchant uh, yeah. that kept barrels of wine inside of the building. There's a, a ton of history, obviously, with yeah. the society and, and Leith and you know, Edinburgh to begin with. But uh, if, if you guys have members, if you've been there, it's pretty cool. And if you're a member, you just present your little ID card, get in, have an amazing bar, and you're bound to meet. 20 new friends, but if it's a, especially if it's a Friday or a weekend right now, if it's a Friday happy hour, it's always packed with people just eager to share whiskey. And so I uh, was really hoping to get there this spring, but this, you know, this Corona situation has kept us all home, but yeah. I mean, still, this is, this is making up for it for the time being. Anyway. Um, so that brought up a fun point just, just to bring his thing. He says, if he has difficulty picking something up on a flavor, he'll close his eyes and go back to the nose and palate because um, it helps bring back memories of a flavor he can't quite recall. So kind of going back to that environment, he's he's having the control on on the variables that he's allowing himself to to smell and taste without thinking about anything else. I mean, it is interesting. I, I do find that when I smell a whiskey or anything, really, it, it triggers memory more than any other. 
you know, I, I find myself remembering these things that I haven't thought about in years because I smell the whiskey. And it'll take me a few seconds. Like, what is that? And I'll, and I'll realize, oh, wow, I haven't actually smelled that thing in yeah. over 10 years, yeah. you know, or, or, or more sometimes. I'm like, oh, yeah, tapioca. Is that, is that tapioca? Tom actually just said, so Tom just confirmed the vaults is the oldest commercial building in Scotland still being used for its original purpose, the trading of wines and spirits. No. So not even just in Edinburgh, but in all of Scotland. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Forgive me. Tom and I did a tour of Leaf last year after quite a few drams, I, I want to say. And so uh, Tom was uh, paying more attention. I apologize. Tom, well done. Um, <laughs> But let, let, let's let's kind of let's let's move on. Obviously, you know we're, we're all sitting here nosing and tasting whiskey, but I think taste is it, it's well, let's taste. Genesis, let's let's taste. Um, so best part, well, <laughs> best part. You know what? I, I keep I keep tasting as we're talking. I want to pour a little bit more in my glass. Actually, you I know haven't what? tasted it all since we started. I'm, I'm sorry. already on my second. You haven't glass. tasted. It? No. I've been a long following. <laughs> I've, been, well, I've been following Zach's nosing techniques and thinking. Okay, I'll sneak a little sip. I'm going to actually switch up to the whiskey here. I'm going to go to the next one. This is uh, 93.119. Charcoal and a I'm joining you, Jenna, on the peat train here. Okay. The recent release from this year here in the U.S. 11-year-old Campbelltown. Mm. First filled bourbon barrel, lightly peated. This is the profile denoted by the light green color, which is kind of washed out on the camera here. But are you switching it up or are you going to stick with the next one? We'll go in the tasting right with this. I've actually, I'm still on my second, the Habuna Matata. Habuna. So I'm enjoying this one. I, I got one more in my in my pocket for after this, but. Oh, I'm going to cheers you all before I, I sip it. It's, you know, ritual. I have to give a cheers before right. I drink. Well, hey, cheers, cheers to you all, to Ben, Jenna, everybody in chat. Cheers. One cool Zoom chat of 185 people <laughs> cheersing at the same time to their camera. Mm. So Jenna, which one is that again? That is 29.247. Oh, yeah. oh, it is like it, it's good. <laughs> don't go on. Don't hold back. I mean, your your love seems very apparent. You know, it's um it's 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 Pete. And you know, I know Matthew J. Ryan's here. Um, and he's, you know, the the Pete partner in crime. That's he's the that's star it. partner. Yes, Star Life. Star Lord. But this. I remember when I got this, I was like, I'm not going to open it. This is like special. Um, and then I was like, you know what? All whiskey is special. So that's why this is getting revisited today. So yeah, this is a Reefal Hogshead X Bourbon 19 year Isla and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So good way to start the weekend. Ryan asks, speaking of tasting tips, anyone save the peat or smoke for last? He says yeah. it destroys his senses for anything else. He does it first. I so mean, yeah, I'll, I'll agree. I, I do peat last. Um, I normally try to switch up my flavor profiles. I know you guys, you guys have done a lot of peat in the last few tastings. Um, well, let's jump into that. I mean, cause that's kind yeah, of, the, I guess that's the last, you know, after we go to nosing, obviously it comes to tasting and, you know, I think I'll, I'll offer it if the tasting is fun. Oh, Jenna, nice banner, by the way. I just saw you got like a whole table set up back there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. I think I didn't see the, uh, the, the logo and everything. That is uh, the best quarantine home, home rig. Yes, this, this is uh, not a bad little office setup. <laughs> yeah. uh, but sorry, sorry, I just saw that. Wow, it's really uh, it's it's great. So just uh, like on the tasting, I'll just I'll kind of share my tips on on it. You know, because nosing we've talked about is no strongest sensory organ in the body. It's I found that it's easier, and I saw some comments too, and I appreciate this. Some people saying, you know, actually, I'm better at tasting, and I can pick up flavors with my palate better than I can my nose. And so I think not, you know, not everybody's the same. For me, nosing, I find I'm more effective that way. But of course, I taste every time too. So when it comes to tasting, I, I, after nosing and sort of getting a good sense, I kind of I tend to abide by this rule that I, I, I not a rule, but a, a tip I, I heard at one point, which is generally as a rule of thumb, the smaller the taste, the more flavor; the bigger the taste, the more alcohol. So just right away when figuring out how much do I taste, when I first started getting a whiskey, I was taking big sips and I was finishing an ounce ram pretty quickly. Yeah. But if you just take a small taste, you'll be able to pick up more of the flavors as opposed to it's, if you take a bigger taste, you'll get more of a wave of alcohol. So I take a small taste. <laughs> I take a small taste, <laughs> but it sort of coat my palate for 10 seconds. And so you guys can talk for 10 seconds. There'll be a moment of silence on my end. <laughs> <laughs> so. While you do that, I'm going to pour my next one. Um, I think it, 
works really well today. Ben sent out an email saying about how single grain is his new favorite thing. Uh, and you all now have it in writing. Um, I'm going to go with G8.10. It's called a trumpet blast in a barrel. We actually got to, I got to share this with some local members here for the uh, Burns night dinner. Uh, and it was probably one of the, one of the hits of the night. So. Oh. So, you know, in tasting, I, I just took, took about 10 seconds. It, you don't have to wait 10 seconds, but I take, take a while, you know, try not to open your mouth. At least that's what I would suggest. Take a moment, let the spirit coat your palate. Obviously if it's strong and if it's cast strength, it's going to be strong. You might end up blinking and that might be a good sign that it's, you might want to add a little bit of water. But when, when tasting, I find, especially for the first dram or the first sip of the first dram, assuming if there's multiple and in this tasting order, my, my sort of my mind is always sort of going haywire. Like there's always this sort of shock effect of, of course, it's alcohol on the palate and sort of goes into a bit of a mayday thing. Uh, so the second taste is always that much easier. Like it's, I find it so much easier. The initial shock of the alcohol is is subdued quite a bit. So the second taste when I go back is always much easier to discern. So isn't that first sip you just essentially wetting your palate, like prepping your palate for, you know, all the fun to come? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, prepping it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Or warming yeah. it up. What, uh, what I like um, when when you let it sit, uh, a lot of the flavors actually when it's blending with your saliva, it's actually opening up some of the chemical reactions to to release more aromas and flavors in your mouth. Um, so that's what I mean. I'm with Ben. I'll normally sit here and let it sit, let it, you know, kind of soak up. I don't want to do it too long because it starts to break down afterward after too long. Um, but I, I find I, I see and, and feel more flavor after I let it sit for a little bit. Yeah. So at this point, and Jenna, I want to hear, actually hear your thought on this because we've talked about this in the past or we haven't talked about it, but in tastings, you've commented on how sometimes, wow, the palate, and the flavors don't match up with what you expected. Right. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start for, for me. I actually, I kind of like that. I, I like being surprised by sometimes if I taste something and I realize, wow, I didn't expect that. You know, the flavors are totally different from my previous assumptions. What do you, what do you, do you have a question on that? hundred percent with you. I love being surprised. Um, that's what got me into whiskey is that I was so surprised. I, I had to learn more. And so I love that element about it when nose and, and palate don't match. Um, when we had that, the, the G8.11, the sweet remedy, oh, that's yeah, yeah. a perfect example of that because the nose on that and the palate are just totally different. Yeah. Was not like when I tasted that, I was so shocked and surprised of the flavors I was getting because they just didn't match. That. And I love that. And I know that there are a lot of, you know, whiskey brands out there that work very hard to get nose and palate to match. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's just another great thing about single cast whiskey is that you don't ever know what you're really going to get. And I love the element of being surprised in that way. So I'm a hundred percent on board with that. Yeah. It's uh, and here's an interesting question from Brian who says, do you find that your, your sense, do you find that you sense different whiskeys on different parts of your tongue, like the tip versus the sides or back? What do you guys think? That's, that's um, well, I mean, I recently actually I just learned, um, you know, how we all learned about, you know, the, the flavors on your tongues and the different parts of your tongue that pick up different flavors. Um, I was I just learned that that's a little bogus, um, that actually all parts of your tongue pick up all flavors um, and that the palate just picks up more specific flavors in a more, I would say, serious way on certain parts. Um, so I actually think that, you know, just letting it sit and not necessarily swirling, but letting it hit all parts of your tongue will really give you the most out of, out of the flavors. So that was something new that I had just learned that I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm taking, you know, a sip for the first time too, um, I'll swish it in my mouth like mouthwash. Um, hmm. just so I'm really getting every nook and cranny of my mouth. Um, because you do taste different things like, you know, on the sides, you'll get, you know, maybe more heat or the finish, you know, is right on the tip of your tongue or, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a roller coaster, you know, sometimes when you're, you're tasting certain whiskeys. And so, um, sometimes I'll, I'll give it just a good Listerine swish and, you know, make sure it gets to every part of my, my mouth and, sure. uh, try it that way. So then smell your arm. <laughs> the, the biggest tip of the day so far has been oh, your arm. You know, I, I think everybody's smelling their arm. 
I think there's also the pat the, the point kind of you alluded to is which is the warm up dram you know, like before a tasting do you guys do that yeah you pick a dram as a warm up dram and what 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 style do you uh, go for I don't know what is your warm up dram if you have one before a serious whiskey tasting. Um, before if I'm going in for like a serious whiskey tasting and I'm tasting things for the first time, I won't drink any. I, that is going to be my first whiskey that I'm going to taste. Um, and I'll just wet my palate with the first sip and I won't judge it off of the first, even the second sip, just because I know my palate's getting acclimated. Um, mm. But if I'm just casual, you know, and at home, you know, I don't know, something ex bourbon probably. Yeah, I'm kind of lighter. Yeah, I'm on the same lines. If I'm out, you know, no one will go do tastings. The first thing I'll actually try and pick up is a very citrus heavy, maybe a little bit of a sour tart cocktail, um, usually gin based because it's not too much flavor going on. Um, if I'm at home, uh, I actually have difficulties now because I have so much and have accrued so many cask strength whiskeys that I usually try and start with something a little bit lower, you know, 40, 43, 46 percent, something that gets my, you know, my my flavors working but doesn't overwhelm them. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'll reach for bourbons um, just because I know the flavors and I know what's going to get activated. But, you know, again, it, it depends on time and place. Scotch in the Bayou is here. Welcome, Scotch in the Bayou. Good to have you. Um, I, I saw some comments earlier, too, about uh, Justin has said, Jenna, I swish too, but more gently than I do for wine, oddly enough. Uh, really interesting from Justin. Um, <laughs> Some of these comments were cracking me up, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the, swish, the swishing was a really popular topic, uh, but you know, I, I saw earlier, or where was it? Oh, Jack Mary said, "Life is like single cast whiskey. You never know what you're going to get." Forrest Gump. That was to your comment, Jenna. About that was a good one. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> uh, and then some comments back about the, the G8.11. Uh, I like that Forrest Gump comment. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, with with tasting, I think then. You know, and I and forgive me, there have been a lot of comments that have come in through, but I saw the one earlier. If you guys caught this, you know, maybe you can clarify or go into more detail. But I saw the, the comments of smelling, tasting, and then while it's swishing in your mouth, smelling again, sort of going back and getting this sort of symphonic experience. So I'm going to do that right now. Uh, and then okay. I'll get back to it. Let's see. Hold on. Everybody, if you guys, by the way, let, let's all do the little at home experiment. Let's all smell and then taste and then smell at the same time. So, launch. <laughs> it's very overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I was scared I was going to spit it out. Oh man, oh, there's so God. much going on. <laughs> that was that was a that was a pro tip, but I think I need to really warm up to that. Yeah. Um, I had the, the, the spirit is so strong, like wow. this strength is so strong. I was tr trying to. What are you about to pour, Jenna? Is it, you're, oh, I'm you're, on. Um, this like some guy they just asked to you know do this amazing ninety three point one one four. Oh, I heard about that guy. Yeah. That's a call, that's a Diddy. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. It's you know. Nice. Um, but I've absolutely loved this whiskey. Um, and I think with the swish, I'm getting a lot of like very bright fruit notes on this. Um, uh, maybe it's because it's coming post. You know. Heavy. I got that. I, I got that guy hanging out right here. Yeah. How do I point to that? There he is. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I drank mine because whiskey's for drinking. So, you know. I had two bottles because the guy that picked it was pretty cool. Um, oh, all right, all right. what he was doing. <laughs> so, I, I guess, you know, there, before, what one was it? Actually, earlier in this week, we sent out, or actually, end of last, about a week ago, we sent out an email to everybody on our mailing list. Side note. S sign up for our mailing list if, if you're not already part of it. You'll be the first to hear about our outturn releases and then get our cool content. Um, shameless plug, please do. Uh, but we sent out an e last week we sent out an email to everybody and, and said, "Hey, you guys have any specific questions you know for that you want us to address?" And relative to tasting whiskey, one question was about adding water. And actually, it wasn't just one. We had about five different questions about adding water to whiskey. It's been kind of a controversial topic. Yeah. I think it's kind of funny because it's it's. You know, it's just adding water to whiskey. But it's one of those things. Or is it right? Is it wrong? Do Scott, yeah. Scott, Scottish people do it? Do they not? So let's take a poll. I mean, if you guys don't mind, comment below or comment in the chat box. Do you add water to your whiskey or not? Just yes or no. Well, let's let's tell him tell them up, and then I'll offer my opinion as well. Um, actually, I think Jenna, you, you and I in our last stream, we've been talking about this quite regularly. What, yeah. What's your approach to adding water? Do you do it or? So for a long time, I didn't. Um. 
because I I naturally gravitate towards single cask cask drink whiskey. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that is like my go to, um, just because I feel like I'm getting the whole experience, um, and I never want to like take away from that. So I always thought, oh well, if I add water, you know, I'm gonna like lessen my experience and. You know, over the past couple of weeks, really, because I've been doing it a lot more, I have learned that that is not true, for me at least. Um, I have, you know, noticed that in adding even just a drop or two of just, you know, room temperature, you know, water, that I'm getting a, a different experience. And so I'm getting, it's really an opportunity to have two different experiences with one whiskey. And again, another great thing about cash drink whiskey is that you have the opportunity to do that. So... Yeah. I, I asked the question. <laughs> well, a, lot, a lot of people, are, you know, you guys are saying yeah. A lot of people, you know, yeah. But but I think I've also seen a comment yes and no. It, it depends. Uh, the best one came from Martha, who said yes. My boyfriend insists. Uh, interesting. Uh, uh, I'm not going to insist you do it, but I, I, you know, personally, I, I I do often, and I think this is leads to one of the more common. You know, a lot of people insist that you do this approach this a certain way. A lot of people say you don't add water because you should only have whiskey in its purest form as it came as is. Others say you absolutely should because it brings out more flavors and aromas. Uh, and then sort of in between, a lot of people I've noticed at least told me in the beginning, yes, you should, and this is how much you should add. Like right. just a few drops. And I see you guys, a drop or two. So I'll offer my kind of my own personal take on it. I, I think it depends. Yeah, it, first of all, it depends. It just depends on the whiskey. Mm -hmm. Not every whiskey is bottled at the same ABV, and you know, the, and, and no two palates are ever the same. I, you know, I think we have similar palates. Some of us are more more sensitive to alcohol in the palate. Others are sort of, uh, you know, uh, can really kind of go all in. And, and Jenna, you you mentioned earlier, you know, in years past, like you were just all gung ho about the cast strength, and I was thinking, wow, that's really it's really intense. That's just the difference between you and I. But uh, showing me up all the time. But for me. <laughs> I think water can and can can help often, but not always the case. And, and I think so. What I like to do this is this is a uh, kind of fancy, so and, fancy. And crystal. Uh, you can get on Amazon for fifteen bucks, or maybe maybe so it's not that fancy, but just a regular sort of Scotch whiskey jug, and has a little spout here. So I like to add a little bit of water, and I usually do this. And you can do it, Zach. What do you have? You have a dropper there. Um, yeah, my uh, my fancy thing is actually a straw. Oh, uh, straws work great too. For just yeah, a, no, so it's a reusable straw, so it's good for the environment. Um, I like to. I've seen a few comments in here though. They say case neat first, add water second. Um, I'm guilty as as Jenna is of. I used to never add it. I, you know, I've, as I get more and more, I like to. I guess challenge my palate and and drink more uh, cask strength whiskey with no water. Um, but recently, I would say in the last few months, I started adding water after a few sips of it neat. Um, just to see, you know, what, what different flavors come about. And I mentioned it earlier in the video, um, essentially what the water's doing is that cask strength, the whiskey is in its purest form. When you proof down a whiskey to 40, 43, 46%, you're literally adding the water beforehand and then you're letting it sit after being bottled. Well, here, what happens is when you add the water, the, the, those, uh, longer fatty acids, uh, come to the top and they change the flavor and the aromas of the whiskey. Um, and I found it really changes my experience when I'm actually tasting whiskey. Um, if I'm just drinking whiskey out of a rocks glass, I don't normally do it just because I'm, I'm already drinking something just to drink it. Um, but I found in my tasting, it's really made a big difference. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm catching the comments too. Uh, it seems pretty popular. Dwayne Roberts says, I always taste neat first and sometimes add water. Uh, George has a drop of water or two to see if it changes. Uh, Christopher Slat says, yes, I start without and then add it and mm -hmm. generally prefer with. And I think that's kind of, uh, for me, that's the same thing. I, I like to taste neat. If I see on the bottle, you know, a lot of our whiskeys being cast strength, some of them come in at like 64. Plus. <laughs> I've seen, we've had some crazy ones, like 67% ABV. What, what is that one, Jenna? Blondie Bombshell is 66%. Yeah. Blondie Bombshell? That's 66%? Wow. Yeah. Funny, Blondie Bombshell, that's if, if you guys are, if you're not a member of the society, interested in joining, that's one of our membership bundles. You you get sort of preferred pricing when you bundle that bottle. I didn't realize that the, the we're, that that's sort of our, our entry into the society. <laughs> hey, here's some. Uh, start off with it. Our entry bundle is uh, 66%, but. 
But if it's so, I mean, if it's so high, you know, sometimes if the alcohol content is so high and you taste it, alcohol is a neurotoxin. It can sort of paralyze your taste buds. Yeah. Um, generally, I do like to taste neat first, take a small sip. And I do what's <laughs> called the blink test. Like if I taste it and I blink, I find that usually I'm more focused on the alcohol and less on the flavors, you know? And so I like to add a little bit of water to get, get to a point where I'm not blinking. You, you know, I'm just, the whiskey's strong on the palate, but not overpowering you know, my yeah. to taste or my ability to taste. So and it's always good to start with maybe a drop or two because you can always add, but you can't take away. Right. Is that a good mm. kind of rule of thumb? That's a really good point too. So, yeah. so add a little at a time as opposed to if you add too much then cause I've, I've had been situations where I've added too much and I've regretted it and right. thought, Oh man, well now I have two ounces in my glass and it's lost a lot of that kick that I, that I enjoyed. Tom is uh, sharing some Charlie McLean tips and says that he says first nose the whiskey and note the amount of prickle or the alcoholic burn after tasting it neat, add one drop of water at a time until that prickle is gone. So it seems like it's a version of the blink test, you know, add just one drop because you can't take it out. But as you, you, you know, you add a drop of water at a time, it allows you to control the amount of water and the flavor that you know you'll enjoy. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Let's see. Jack Mirror says dumb question. No such thing. But what would happen if I added a drop of sparkling water rather than still water? I mean, I think oftentimes, correct me if I'm wrong, but the sparkled water, most of it's mineral water, and there is sort of an underlying subtle flavor to a lot of sparkling waters, right? I, I'm just thinking of like a Pellegrino or Perrier. Like there, there is sort of a flavor to it. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I, forgive me. I'm not like a sparkling Joker water. Says it makes a highball. Essentially. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, well, a club soda. Yeah. Club we soda. actually, we actually did that earlier. We, um, someone brought it up, um, before when we did a tasting a few months ago where we did our Pete fairy in a highball and some of the, the venues I did literally, you add sparkling water and there's your highball. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> but I'm curious to the point, if you add a drop or two of sparkling water yeah. to open as opposed to, so they're not making a cocktail, but just adding a drop of sparkling like a drop water, at a time, yeah. all that impact. I've seen people do that actually. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. interesting. That'll be a fun experiment to have over the weekend. If I can <laughs> sparkling water. <laughs> yeah. yeah so well, sparkling water versus still. Yeah. Yeah. I, su I suspect because there is sort of a subtle flavor in a lot of the sparkling yeah. waters that it would impact the experience from a flavor standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I'm just speculating, I don't know how much it would really change the. The texture, well, I guess the, the texture would be the same, but I don't know how much it would taste the overall experience different from a, a regular still water because it's, it would be such a small amount of sparkling water. You know, yeah. so there wouldn't be any bubbles in it. But Tom says salt is often added, so I'm wondering oh. if that'll actually play with your palate and and change the way that you're you're seeing those flavors. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Alden, Alden Hart says pure blasphemy, but a young and sprightly makes a fantastic old fashioned. I, I don't, I don't know what's blasphemous about that. I mean, I think the best cocktails take the take the best ingredients, and I think yeah. uh, there you yeah. go. I don't know. Have you done that, Jenna? You're big on the young and sprightly. I do love the young and sprightlies. No, but I love a peated highball. Oh yeah, it is yeah. just great with a little bit of like honey syrup and a mm -hmm. lemon wedge. That sounds great. It is the best. <laughs> I've got to say, we were we were actually at uh, the Whiskey Project in Atlanta, um, and they made the highballs with some. God, they used um, some some sparkling water, or no, they used soda water, but they used some honey in it. Oh, it was fantastic! Oh, it was so good. So there was a, qu a question here. Actually, this was submitted when we sent the email out last week, uh, just asking for questions in advance, and and there was a question here. Um, from Shamit Patel asking, is there a way to calculate the ABV change with the addition of water? As in a rule of thumb or formula to determine the change in ABV of the dram as one adds a given amount of water. So, you know, we know, I guess, just to summarize, we know on a bottle of whiskey, it says the ABV. So this one is 59.2%, close to 60%. Is there a way of knowing? Uh, what do you guys think? Do you, do, do you, Consider is that something you thought of, or, or I'm not a math guy, so <laughs> I, uh, I do not consider this. You're, you're like that. You're like <laughs> pour it in a drink, um, but 
it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I think it's really cool. It's yeah, you know, that's being a really able to, to think about those types of things when you're drinking whiskey. Like you don't think about that. Um, I'm wondering if that actually has a has a scientific answer to it. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Jenna? I don't know. Um, that's I don't know if there would really be a way to measure that at home. Um, unless maybe you have the tools necessary to do so. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that would be, that would be a good thing to research though. That would be a, a, a very good, you know, topic to dig into and <laughs> Alden up. says no algebra. It's Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, I, I've certainly thought about it because, you know, no pellets, two pellets are the same and we all have sort of different preferences. And that is what's great about cast strength is that you can sort of dial in the strength to your own palate base with the addition of water. But you, I guess I've, I have, so I've, I've wanted, I've been curious personally, like what is my preferred ABV? And I realized it just depends on the day and the whiskey and my mood and you know, all the things you talked about, like it really yeah. plays a part in the sort of strength of the whiskey that I want. What was my day like? Do I need something strong and fast or do I need just sort of a subtle relaxing you right. know, gram? But I, I mean, you can think real thumb if a whiskey's 50% ABV, half of it is alcohol, the other half is essentially water. You know, if you're adding, and it's one ounce, if you're, sorry, Alden and the anti-algebra comments out there, but <laughs> if, you're, if you're adding, you know, essentially a, a half an ounce of, of water, you're increasing the volume by 50%. So your 50% alcohol has now been diminished to 33%, a third. Uh, anyway, so for for all the math people, so I've been eyeballing this. You, I kind of just think about this. Oh, I'm at, I'm adding this much water. It's about <laughs> half of what that's there. So anyway, that's my non-formulaic approach to sort of uh, doing algebra on a Friday. But I, I, so I, I guess the answer is no. There's no official way that I mean, we know. You can have a hydrometer, right? Like let's drink whiskey. Yeah, let's, I was gonna say let's drink whiskey. Just that he has a hydrometer. Well, well you, you put on a hydrometer. I would imagine so. I, I think we, we could. Yeah, yeah, one could do that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's what uh, master blenders do when they're yeah. when they're uh, putting in the water and mixing the barrels. But there's a reason I'm not that person. Huh. Yeah, and that there was another part of the question was, well, actually, the question was prefaced with Shamit's comment that, oh, that is strong. By the way, go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> distracting here. <laughs> I got to add more water because that is. It was real intense. Uh, Jimmy said, you know, we talk about adding water to a dram to bring out different flavors and aromas, which I find that is the case. You know, reducing, as I just did here too, and I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to demonstrate, like just adding some more water to this lightly peated whiskey has cut down the smoke a little bit more and brought out more of the, the briny. This is a coastal Campbelltown whiskey, so it sort of has this briny, salty sort of sea foam undertone. Has it got the funk? It's got a little bit of funk, a little bit of sort of iodine medicinal funk that a lot of Campbelltown whiskeys tend to have. But a lot of that has been elevated by adding water, which has sort of cut down the smoke. So, and Shamid points out in the, in prefacing the question saying, you know, we do, as we increase the water, more change occurs. A prime example being master distillers, watering down a 20 to 30% ABV to bring out more flavors. And I think Jenna, we talked about that in a stream that we did in, in our, I think our, was it our preview tasting that we did earlier on? Uh, mentioned that, that master blenders will commonly dilute the spirit down to like 23, 30%, really reducing the alcohol. So when it comes to making the whiskey, really just focusing on the flavors that are in there, which is uh, interesting, but I don't know. Seeing Brian. a lot of people talk about hydrometers and, and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a very so, different whiskey chat here. <laughs> so summing it up, I mean, I mean, I want to just kind of open it up too. Actually, you know what we should do is, uh, well, yeah, we, I think for the most part, I, I've, I've kept a list of all the questions that were submitted and we've addressed, I think for the most part, all of them just in, you know, our collective conversations, but um, to, to somehow, I, I know these are the you guys, the guys are killing me in the chat. It's, it's, I know. it's hilarious. Like it's, <laughs> it's getting, it's not, Vesper asks, what am I drinking? It's uh, 93.119 charcoal in a honey pot, 11 year old Campbelltown, lightly peated. My first fill bourbon barrel. I uh, I actually see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah. Kind of similar. One asked how long you should wait before trying your whiskey after pouring it into a glass. And the other asked how long you should wait after dropping water into your whiskey before trying it. 
Um, does anybody have an idea, you know, any preferences on letting it breathe or, or letting the air contact affect the whiskey or do some people just, you know, dig right in? Do you guys have preferences? You're the note. <laughs> naturally when i'm i'm doing that i guess i've never really timed it to see how long i wait but i feel like just in like my standard kind of like motions after i pour it and kind of wait and prepare myself it's probably like a good five minutes yeah i'd say about the same for myself yeah. you bet yeah I, I mean i think it depends uh if it's if it's a new bottle you know i think the big thing for me if it's a brand yeah, new yeah. bottle of cast strength whiskey you know, our whiskeys, for instance, when we're talking about waiting for the FedEx truck, but and, and all the excitement. But realistically, when you open the first bottle, the open the bottle the first time, had the first dram. I find that they're never at the level that they get to after about two or three drams over the course of a few days. Yeah. I mean, you can have two or three drams at a night, but I find that after just being open for a little bit, and I'll show like this bottle here. Can you see? Can you see the level? It's sort of up to here. Yeah. Like just having this sort of exposure to air over. And this has been open for a few weeks. The whiskey is so much more developed and just open and just un are unlocked, if you will. Uh, so in that sense, I think the first thing is understanding, like, is it a fresh pour from a new bottle? Because if it's brand new, I would probably let it sit if I can for 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate we don't always have the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know that's crazy. But to pile onto that like if what ben said i'll open the bottle and i'll kind of let it sit open i'll pull the cork out put it next to it i'll pour something else to enjoy while i wait um, give it a little bit of time to breathe and you know i don't want that that's some really young high alcohol waiting for me to drink so i, I give it a little bit of time i'd say that's a good and i mean it does change like you said so much you know you can pop a you know cork on a new bottle and taste it and when you taste it again in two weeks it's going to be you know a very different adventure yeah um, so yeah but for just standard tasting i don't wait 30 minutes maybe i need to work on that I'll, I'll say for 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 our society tastings that i host i uh i take the liberty you know the difficult job of i'll actually open them all the day before yes. and i'll taste them so they can breathe. So by the time we get into the members' glasses, they've already had that time. I'm not like, you know what, well, wait 30 minutes before you taste that. Um, and I've, I've actually found better um, results from that. I've, I've seen people have, have, they're finding more flavors and they're enjoying it a little bit more. Um, and they're not surprised per se when they take that, when they buy that bottle, get it home, they drink it the first time. They're like, this doesn't taste what I bought. Right. Tastes like what I bought. So. When Zach, when Zach, when you first joined us, was over a year ago now, right? Or we're coming up? Uh, just about, yeah. It's just about a year now. Well, but yeah, okay. It was just about a year. When, I remember when Zach joined, and you were doing your uh, one of the one of your first tasting events, you know, for members down in Florida. Zach's based in Florida, uh, and I and I and I, I I sent him a text. I said, Zach, hey, for, on this topic, I was said, hey, can you please do me a huge favor? Or just do us a huge favor and, and just <laughs> taste every whiskey, get open it, and taste. Uh, so that you know, the next day when you do you taste with, with other society members, at least they had a chance to taste the whiskey after it's had the first 24 hours of breathe. I think that exactly you're like, Oh wow, I can't believe this is my life right now. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's two o'clock cool. in the afternoon on a, on a Tuesday, and I gotta taste all this whiskey. Wow, <laughs> please just, oh, just taste all the whiskey. Like, wow. like, wait, wait, seriously? So you're asking me, okay, yeah, yeah. it's it's a it's serious, Zach, it's serious business. Uh, <laughs> So uh, any other questions you guys have about the tasting? I mean, just to recap, you know, Jenna, you can introduce us to some, I think, pretty cool tips about just setting the mood. And honestly, I, the inter the one that I'm most interested in is sort of smelling your arm. Yeah. You uh, just sort of neutralize your, I don't know, your sensor, sensory, yep. your sense. You, as you stated, it's just a good way to reset, um, especially if you have multiple whiskeys that you're trying to taste. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, setting the mood, and I, I'm going to do that now is just kind of experiment with just different light with lighting, and then glassware was huge. I mean, I, I think what came, came out what I got out from that too was the fact that I, I do want to do more of these experiments, and I would recommend this of pouring the same whiskey in different glasses yeah. and just noting the difference, you know, and different styles of whiskey in different glasses. I'll uh, I'll point two comments out here that actually are things I want to try. Uh, Scotch on the Bayou says for special bottles, uh, she likes to keep a record a journal entry of the tastings at opening a third, half and two thirds down um, to kind of see what the different flavors are. 
And then uh, George Kaplan asks, who else covers their empty glasses and noses in the next day? Um, I'll say I'm guilty of that. Um, I've definitely done it uh, with heavily sherried whiskeys, and it is a it's a big treat in the morning. Um, it definitely, uh, <laughs> that sherry really likes to show itself. Um, but those are two things that I think I, I want to kind of try to, to change up a little bit on, on tasting notes. There. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Susan asks, if you're doing a big tasting, do you spit? I presume like in wine, do you guys yeah. do that? If you're, if you're doing a tasting, do you spit if like kind of spit out in a, in a dump bucket of such? I, I do. If I know, if I, if I find something that I, uh, prefer over the others along the way, um, if I have to keep myself in a professional setting, um, it's a little bit easier for me to kind of spit. I get the flavors for the most part. Um, you don't, you don't lose the alcohol burn. It's all still there. Um, if I'm just drinking a glass or two, I, I won't, but you know, if you're drinking, you know, like Jenna said, 60 things or 10 things in a day, it, it normally it's safe. Not only does it save your palate, um, but it keeps you level, level headed and, and allows exactly. you to kind of enjoy everything on the same level. Exactly. Do you do the same thing, Jenna? Yeah. If yeah. I'm, you know, if you're judging, you know, again, like a whiskey competition or you're having, you know, more than just a standard, you know, two or three different drams, um, then typically, yes, I would. Yeah. Uh, PDJ8671 asks, what's your view on how long you can keep a bottle once opened? without having a noticeable degradation in the whiskey? That's a good question. Yeah. Do you guys have a... I'd say it depends bottle to bottle. Um, I've had bottles that we've talked about. They uh, they taste great after a day or two or, or six months later. Um, I've also had bottles that don't taste so good after you know a couple months of being open. Yeah. Um, but I guess it depends on fill level. I don't know about you, Jenna. Yeah. Um... I, the, there's only one bottle of whiskey that's lasted in our house for more than like two years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, and it was the, the whiskey that actually got me into whiskey. Um, I just don't want to finish it like for nostalgia purposes. So I kind oh. of like taste it, you know, every once in a while. And it definitely has changed um, over the years, but that's been open for about four years now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So again, I think it is, you know, it's every bottle is different, but um, things don't usually last more than a year and a half or two years in this house. So, hmm. sure. I, I think I'm probably have the unpopular uh, take on this one. I, I do keep whiskey for a long time. You know, I, I do have quite a few bottles that have been open for four or five years. And uh, it's just a weird thing of I, I, I rarely finish bottles. I just have a, th I've been fortunate, you know, obviously to, yeah. Well, I think I've gone crazy in my life of acquiring <laughs> quite a lot of whiskey. Maybe that's maybe I've overdone it, but I just every bottle has its own sort of place for me and yeah. in my memory. And I like you, Jenna. Like I never want them to end. Yeah. So I always have a little bit. I know that I can go back, but I do find that you know when you consider the air to liquid ratio, as you go down, oxidization sort of accelerates. Yeah. So uh, you know if it's like this. Also, if it's a high strength, like it'll it'll last a bit longer. Uh, but once it gets down to like a half to a third, if it's a really a really good whiskey that I always want to have for, and sip for years on end, I'll, I will transfer it to a smaller bottle. Yeah, so, Alvin right. just pulled there. Said that, yeah, to just minimize oxidization. Smart. But, but for others, like I find that some styles of sherry, uh, styles of sherry, excuse me, some styles of whiskey, like sherry matured whiskey, the cast strength, I actually find it sort of improves with a little bit of oxidization. Yeah time so i, I think will let those go yeah. I'm, I'm with you i think the spice kind of levels out and it really brings forth those dried just dried fruit flavors and they, they kind of coat your tongue a little bit better yeah tom says he only spits on the inside he only spits on the inside uh tom smith says pro tip all caps with society bottles you've sorry with society bottles you've had a while Invert it before popping top up. It moistens the cork, keeps from cracking, and mixes oils. So essentially, so, I, I, I yeah, yeah. Thing. yeah. I just wet the cork. I don't like breaking corks. So if if I ever open a bottle of whiskey, I'll turn it upside down, and then it moistens the it moistens it. I don't know if you can see that. That's a really good tip because with old yeah. I, when we were at the uh, down in Vegas at that tasting, did you see that we had an old bottle, a thirty year old, uh, that broke when we uncorked it. Yep. But yep. that's a good tip to sort of a uh, just moisten the cork because they can sort of dry out over time. Yeah. yeah. I got to remember to do that more often. Yeah. 
I've got to say, I, you know, you guys impressed me with bottles open for four or five years. I haven't been legally allowed to drink for that long. And, uh, Okay, I had bottles for two yeah. years. Oh, okay. I'm like, whoa, this is oh. a long time. <laughs> All right, cry me a river. All right. All right. Uh, well, Zach, that's why you have such great legs, as we've learned. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey leg, whiskey leg, the legs in your glass, guys. Everybody calm down. Okay. Um, my legs are actually gone. Well, I don't know. I, I've learned a lot. Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot from you two, just alone. I got some great tips. Um, I, I love I love Jenna like your point of setting I keep going back to that but like setting the mood which I've sort of recognized as being important but kind of contextualizing it it's been helpful and Zach your uh, your point about like memory triggering memory and smelling and why that's relevant so, like, from a sort of biological standpoint has me uh, eager to I have my weekend experiments lined up right now in my mind so, no, everything. I'm sorry Honey, why are you smelling that rock oh no reason don't worry about it oh, oh. I guess the, the one thing Carrie, Carrie Baldwin just asked: Does temperature matter when store, storing? Can you store in a wine fridge? I, you know, I, I think for te technically, I well, technically, but typically, rather, a few drams. I, I do. I think it's better best to store out of natural light. You know, yeah. minimize the amount of light that can hit the spirit through the glass, mm. and then sort of in a cold doesn't have to be damp, but a cold or like a basement or cellar, if you can, or at least just just be in a closet out of light where it's cooler. Yeah, uh, I think will help preserve the longevity. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, um, so that's that. I mean, that, that's our. Those, that's concludes our. We went overboard. We thought we would do it for an hour. It's we're coming up on the hour and a half. Yeah. But, uh, thank you guys so much for for tuning in. This was great. You know, we're going to be coming back with more uh, live streams like this, talking about different topics, uh, yeah. and we'll be sending. You know, as I mentioned, if you guys aren't subscribed to our mailing list, just go to smwsa.com. Tune in because we're sending out emails, just pulling questions all the time. Uh, so if there's anything specific you'd like uh, to see moving forward, just reach out to us. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's been kind of wild. It's, it's been a crazy month. Uh, yeah. society and with I, all I mean, I'm, I'm so much looking forward to May. I can only see how, how exciting May is going to be. And, yes. um, you know, like Ben said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out for our next chat. Um, you can, you know, email info at smwsa.com or myself at zach at smwsa.com. Um, we'll make sure to be able to kind of answer those questions for you guys next time. You're ever interested in anything, um, you know, always, always feel like you're included. Get, get joining in the chat. We love talking to you guys. So it's, it's, it's been a blast. There's a lot of you guys here. This is awesome. Yeah. This has been a great way to end a week. So yeah. thank you yeah. all for being here. This has been so much fun. Yeah. I think on that point, we're talking about May, just to, just to like close on this, you know, it's crazy. It's been crazy for us. You know, if you go to our shop online, you'll see uh, our collection <laughs> is, is almost close to zero. It's the first time it's ever happened. Uh, you know, really it's, it's due to the fact that a lot of us are all at home doing things like this and, and really finding whiskey exploration at home to be a, a much needed distraction or just a fun activity at home. And, but I, I can assure you we're doing everything on the back end to, they support our members with what is going to be perhaps our largest largest outturn ever released here in the U.S. Um, coming just very soon in, in yeah. May. So stay, stick funny. around, stay with us. We appreciate the, the patience and we apologize for any frustration you might feel. Due to the fact that you know our whiskey is is very highly sought out right now, uh, I don't know that that's going to change, but we will have a lot more offerings and a large variety, I think, ever. Uh, coming out here very soon and we'll I guess we'll be back on YouTube doing a preview tasting of those so I'll make sure you won't miss it but yeah. thanks thanks for for making this an amazing you know I think experience for all of us and making it fun and obviously your your enthusiasm for the society and helping us grow this has been spectacular so yeah, yeah uh, so. all right well no, until next time, guys time and enjoy the weekend yeah. yeah Tom says 20 casks coming specifically 20 casks wow that's a uh, that's a busy, a busy month. We'll, we'll have at least 20 casts to start. You know, we won't get it beyond that. But cheers, guys. Yeah, cheers. See you guys next time. Bye. See ya.